you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast, the hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Are you ready? Chris Voss. I don't know what the hell that means. Hey guys, welcome to the show, the ChrisVossShow.com. Thanks for tuning in on this uh, beautiful Friday. It's a Friday. Some of you may be watching this like 10 years from now and you're like, what? It's not Friday. They they don't even have Fridays anymore because I don't know, the apocalypse or Planet of the Apes or I don't know, pick your pick your uh, apocalyptic meme. Anyway, guys, uh, hopefully that doesn't happen. And this is why we have great authors, brilliant people on the show, so they can come on the show and help make sure that we don't enter another apocalypse. My guest right now is going, I don't remember writing any of that in my book about apocalypse. So <laughs> what the hell is he going on about? But we always improv the front of the show, and we appreciate you guys being here. Go to YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss, hit the bell notification button. Go to Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, see everything we're reading or viewing over there. Go see our big LinkedIn group 132,000 people over there and also the linkedin newsletter that thing is killing it over there people love that darn thing it's pretty freaking amazing also go to all the groups facebook linkedin twitter wherever the, those cool kids are playing so we're excited to announce my new book is coming out it's called beacons of leadership inspiring lessons of success in business and innovation it's going to be coming out on october 5th 2021 and i'm really excited for you to get a chance to read this book it's filled with a multitude of my insightful stories lessons lessons, my life, and experiences in leadership and character. I give you some of the secrets from my CEO entrepreneurial toolbox that I use to scale my business success, innovate, and build a multitude of companies. I've been a CEO for, uh, what is it, like uh, 33, 35 years now. We talk about leadership, the importance of leadership, how to become a great leader, and how anyone can become a great leader as well. Or order the book wherever fine books are sold. Today we have an amazing gentleman on the show. He has an amazing story and a brand new book. Who saw that one coming new books coming out uh this was a book that came out january 18th 2022 you can get it in all different formats the book is called 1000 or i'm sorry 100 thousand first bosses my unlikely path as a 22 year old lawmaker and we're joined today by will haskell he's an amazing young gentleman and he is an american politician and member of the connecticut state senate representing district 26 the district includes the town of redding redgefield wilton and parts of bethel weston Westport and New Con. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but what's interesting is, is he's not only very young, but he also, his district had not been represented by another Democrat since 1973. And he took over some incumbencies in 2018 and again in 2020 holding the seat, which is pretty amazing. And I think his story is amazing as well. So Will, welcome the show. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. Such a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much for coming. So give us your plugs, your dot coms where people can find you on the interwebs, please. Sure. Will Haskell for CT on Instagram is my favorite social media platform. I try to use it to give people a behind the scenes look at what actually happens in state government, what it looks like for a bill to become a law. I, I Will Haskell CT on Twitter. Folks are welcome to contact me through uh, my website as well. I really believe that the job of an elected official is to be accessible to the public. So I spend actually a huge chunk of my day writing back to the folks in my district and keeping them updated on you know my work on their behalf at the state capitol. That's always smart. All politics are local, as they like to say. So what motivates you want to write this book? So every few months, I would get a call from a young person who wanted to run for office. They were in Alabama and wanted to run for a board of alder seat. They were in Florida and they wanted to run for a state Senate race. And they always ask the same questions. Uh, They were questions large and small. How do I find a treasurer? Who should be my campaign manager? And then, you know, what if I feel as though I don't know enough to run? What will, what does it actually mean to bill? How do you learn how to legislate after election day? And I wasn't sure how to answer any of those questions, Chris, because I only represent one tiny corner of one tiny state. But I did learn some things along my journey to the state capitol. 
I mm-hmm. ran when I was 22 years old. My college roommate became my campaign manager, and our very first oh. fundraiser was in our college dorm room. We made a lot of mistakes, and we got some things right. And I tried to capture all that in a book that uh, shows the good, the bad, the funny, hopefully, and frankly, the ugly of what it actually looks like to run for office, what it takes to uh, legislate, and why I desperately hope other young people will take that leap of faith and not just show up at the ballot, but start to show up on the ballot every election day as well. Yeah. So the name of your book is 100,000 First Bosses, and it shows you it looks like uh, knocking on some doors there in, in your hometown. What, 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 where does the title come from? So this was my first job out of college, and everybody's first job has a lot of stress associated with it, right? You're eager to please your first boss, to make to, to reassure them that they've, that they've made the right choice when they went out on the limb and hired you. In my first job, I had 100,000 constituents who lived in my district, and I viewed all of them as my bosses. Uh, they were 100,000 first bosses. And part of legislating is figuring out how to manage those expectations, how to keep in touch with the folks who voted for you, and as importantly, or more importantly, the folks who didn't vote for you. How to disappoint your friends sometimes, because the campaign trail is all about being popular, but legislating is about much more than that. It's about doing what you think is right and helping to move the state forward. So Mm -hmm. it's about learning how to disappoint some of your bosses sometimes and taking responsibility for that, asking for their vote when re-election day comes. Uh, Mm -hmm. it that that's that's the reason for the title behind the book so you're going to college what are you studying in college do you have an interest in political science as a young person is there is is there some turning point or prompt that brings you to the moment of going i'm going to run well i was always sort of interested in politics you know my dad chris used to bring me to the new hampshire primary we had some family Mm -hmm. up there and i don't know if you've ever ever gone to new hampshire for the primary but it's like you get to witness democracy on the ground floor i still think it's the coolest thing in the world you're shaking hands with candidates at the dump and you're sitting down with them in living rooms over coffee you're you know sharing a pie with them at the local diner but instead of those candidates running for you know mayor or state senate one of the down ballot races like the one i i'm in they're running to be the leader of the free world it it really is humbling and exciting to see so as a little kid i just remember you know meeting a young state senator named barack a young senator named barack obama and i just being in awe of the optimism and and the the hard work that he brought to public service Anyways, fast forward, and I was studying government in college, going to school in Washington, D.C., thought that I wanted to work in government in one capacity or another. But I'll be honest, I, I didn't follow state politics. I think there are a lot of people out there like that who just, they don't know who their state senator is. Maybe they don't even know that they have a state senator. I think people can be forgiven for that, right? We lead busy lives, all of us. And if you have time to tune into politics, probably going to watch the White House press conference and not what's happening in, in your local legislature. But That's here's true. the thing that I've learned. There's a ton of interesting things. How, whether, whether you care about the quality of the roads that you drive on or the quality of the air that you breathe or the water that you drink or the quality of the public schools that your kids go to, all of those decisions are actually made at the local and state level. Yeah. So the turning point for me, the, the aha moment was President Trump's election when I decided, you know what? I didn't agree with what was happening at the national level. I wanted to get involved. And D.C. was going to be rather disappointing for the next few years. The first line of defense, if you were worried about college affordability, environmental protections, gun violence prevention, reproductive health care and freedom, all of those issues, now they were going to be decided at the state level. So for the first time in my life, I, I found out who my state senator was. All politics are local. Now, d- let me go back to one thing. You mentioned pie. If I run for Congress, I can get free pie? Oh, yeah. I have to say, though, the quality of the food that you eat at, at campaign events, it, it varies, man. I actually go like this. I went to my old elementary school last week to talk to students, and I gave a little spiel about local and state government and how their voice was important. And I said, does anybody have any questions? And this one hand in the back shot up. So I, you know, of course, you got to call on that kid first. And he was like, do you ever have to go to events where you eat things that you don't like? And I was like, yes, all the time, all the time. That's such a great question. <laughs> oh, note to self, start running for office and have a pie campaign. So Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the American can be better, damn it, if we just make better pies. That can turn it, you know, it used to, I mean, that's how America used to be great. When America was great, I mean, I'm just doing a bit here. When America was great, we had apple pie and baseball 
and we still have baseball, but it's boring. Anyway, I'm just joking. You know, we lost two people in the baseball crowd there. Oops. And uh, people on the uh, rhubarb pie are probably like, why'd you choose Apple? Fuck you. I'm turning this off now. So I've lost <laughs> that crowd as well. Anyway, so this is an interesting story. Uh, you know, I'm seeing here you overthrew a, an incumbent who is a Republican. And then, you know, this is, in my understanding from the wiki here, 26th district had not been represented by another Democrat. So you're not only like young and your first time at this run at this, you're overthrowing a, a lot of, uh, a lot of establishment. Is that correct? Yeah. So I'll be, I'll be frank because the theme of this book is full disclosure, right? I, I really thought you were Will, back. not Frank. <laughs> You're right. Okay, I'll be. Right. I had to I'll do an airplane joke there. Anyways, you know, I, the theme of the book is honesty, and I want to give people sure. a real look at at the, what this process was like. I when I found out that my state senator was um, a member of the opposite political party, I was surprised. When I found out that she and I had fundamentally different views on a whole host of issues, for example, she said that we went too far in regulating guns. I thought we hadn't gone far enough. I, I lived right around the corner. I live right around the corner from Sandy Hook Elementary School. That tragedy. Oh, wow. It's fresh on the minds of, of the folks that I represent. So I was shocked to find out that the incumbent was somebody who I disagreed with. I was really shocked to find out, Chris, that it was somebody who had been in office for longer than I had been alive. And oh, then wow. the final straw that broke the camel's back was when I learned that nobody else was running. Sometimes when there are longtime incumbents, everybody just starts to assume yeah, like, that the seat yeah. belongs to them. But that's nonsense, right? In a democracy, yeah. the seat belongs to the people who show up on election day. So I decided to throw my hat in the ring, not because I thought we were going to win. The district, as you said, it hadn't been held by a, a Democrat since the 1970s. But I thought that, that running was important. Even if we lost, it's just a valuable, even if your listeners disagree with everything else I say today, we all should agree that incumbents should be held accountable for their voting record. Every candidate should have to go out and knock on doors and defend the work that they've done. When you're mm -hmm. speaking on behalf of constituents, you owe it to those constituents to circle back and talk about your voting record and uh, you know have your feet held to the fire. So that was that was our goal initially. So how did you beat her initially? Did you, I mean, what, what was your strategy? What was the difference that made? Well, the answer to that, I think, is really on the cover of the book. It's nothing all that mm -hmm. novel, but a lot of people write off the importance of knocking on doors. And yeah. I, I don't know, I'm no expert. Maybe they're right. President Biden became the, you know, president of the United States in a campaign where door knocking wasn't even really possible. And he earned more votes than any other candidate in American history. So there's an argument that door knocking is a thing of the past. But I disagree with that argument because I found tremendous value in going out. It's the last opportunity, Chris, to meet folks who are apolitical, right? Like mm -hmm. I could put a billboard up or I could put an ad on the internet, but you're not really going to reach those folks who they don't care about politics, but they do care about the pothole on their street. They do yeah. care about the quality yeah. of their kid's kindergarten teacher. They yeah. do care about finding an affordable place for their parents to retire in Connecticut, right? And uh -huh. when you go out and knock doors, what, what that provides to a candidate that a billboard doesn't is it teaches you what your community actually cares about. So yeah. I knocked around 4,000 doors and I asked every voter wow. the same question. I said, what's, what's the most important issue for you? And in doing mm -hmm. that, I figured out what actually keeps the folks that I wanted to represent up at night. And sometimes they brought up things I had no idea about, but those were the most valuable conversations because I could read up on those problems, circle back, let them know how I, I would like to help if, if I could earn their vote. And it didn't just make me a better candidate. It, it eventually made me a better state senator, right? I, I circled back on those houses that had potholes in the street and I made sure that those potholes were filled. And I, I just think that there's such value in door knocking and I recommend it to every candidate I speak to. That's why I, I put that photo on the cover of my book. I love it. All all politics are local. I mean, AOC. I'm not. I'm not familiar with the two other m many people that run campaigns, but I know AOC did a lot of door knocking. You know, there's the famous photo of her shoes wearing out, and uh, you know, and and I imagine you know it's a good way to get yourself in front of people. I mean, here in Utah, the legislators knock on my door, uh, and they usually want to put a sign out too on the corner. Uh, I had one of those corner lots, so it was. It was. It was I guess it was popular. But, but no, it's a good way to get to know your constituents, get them to know you as a face, uh, brand name recognition. And I guess they like you so much, they had you back in two years uh, again. Well, it was, that was is a whole other campaign, right? Running for office as a, as a challenger, your, your role is then just to sort of 
present some ideas about how we could do better to kind of paint a vision for our community's future and to, to poke holes in the voting record of the incumbent and say, listen, I don't agree with this person and, and I don't think you do either. Running for re-election as an incumbent, totally different, right? You are, I voted on, you know, hundreds and hundreds of bills and your job is to go out there and defend those votes and mm -hmm. talk about why you think that they were the right thing to do. Or if you got it wrong, to be humble about that and say, listen, I try to get it right more often than I get it wrong, but we're not perfect. Um, anyways, it was fun to run for re-election. I have to say it was a, it was a campaign that was totally different in its nature as the COVID pandemic. So there were other challenges about how to actually, we couldn't go out and door knock at the same level as we had in the first mm -hmm. race. But uh, yeah, I'm just now uh, wrapping up my second term. And you, in 2019, you were named as Forbes 30 under 30 in law and policy. You're, are you still the youngest state senator in the country? I think I am. There's uh, not a ton of great data out there that I've seen, yeah. but uh, folks keep telling me that. So I, I, I think I believe them. I don't want to be. I hope that other young people run for office. I think we should have uh, young people at every table where decisions are made. I think we, we as a generation bring an important and unique perspective that's often lacking right now from the public policy making process. So I don't want to be the youngest state senator for long, but I think I am right now. I hope your book inspires young people to get involved in politics. You know, we, we have a big product review and gaming community with the Chris Voss show where we've, you know, we've done product reviews for 12 years along with the podcast. And we used to be really into tech for the first 10 years with the podcast. And so, you know, I see a lot of young people and they're really discouraged. They don't care about politics. They think politics are stupid. I have to admit when I was young, I thought it was too. And this is their future. You know, and, you know, I, I am a moderate Democrat, but I was reading, you know, just the, today about Mrs. Feinstein and I'm not knocking her record or what she's done, but, you know, she's 88 and I guess there's some leaks coming out that maybe it's time to go and uh, maybe her mental state is, is not good. And I'm not knocking her. I'm just using the example of we have a lot of very old people in Congress who who kind of, in my opinion, I'm not saying Mrs. Feinstein is out of touch. I'm just using this as an example. But, you know, when I see uh, a bunch of very old gentlemen and women up on the thing, daises at Congress, and, and they serve well and they serve power. But, you know, when I see like the interviews with technology, you know, we're, we're talking about how to, how to pre prevent attacks from Russia and cybersecurity, you know, and different things like that. And, you know, these guys don't even know how to operate their cell phone. <laughs> you know, when I see that sort of thing, I'm like, we, we need more young people who understand the future of where things are going, who understand the technology basis for where we have to have. I think we had Will Hurd on the other day, the former Senator or Congressman Will Hurd. You know, and I said to him, I says, I remember watching all those, everybody just lose their minds when Mark Zuckerberg and, and Google showed up. They didn't understand anything of what was going on. It was embarrassing. And, you know, well, there's some things to senior statement and stuff like that. We also need more younger blood. There needs to be more of a balance, I guess, is maybe what I, I try and suggest of people. And, and I hope your book inspires young people to get involved, to give a damn about their future, because this is their future. I, 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 it's exactly how I feel, Chris. Every day, whether it's in your local town hall or whether it's at your state capitol or, as you said, whether it's at the Congress of the United States, Folks are sitting around these tables and they're making decisions about what the next 10, 20, 50 years of American life will look like. And by and large, with a few exceptions, they're doing so without any input from the stakeholders in that future. And that yeah. should scare all of us who believe in the promise of representative democracy. It's not about replacing one generation with the other. It's about Anyone who's touched by public policy should have a say in creating that public policy. That's why we fight so hard to elect more women into office. Mm -hmm. It's why I believe so strongly that we need more people of color in office. And it's why I'm really dedicated to making sure that more young people step up and do yeah. decide that they're going to pursue public service because yeah. they uniquely know what it's like maybe to participate in a school shooter drill. They know how hard it is to try to afford a degree in the 21st century. They know what affirmative consent should look like on a college campus and maybe tragically what it doesn't always look like. They know mm -hmm. that climate change isn't just like an academic problem, but poses a real existential threat to their ability to lead happy and healthy lives. There's so many valuable insights that I think young people could bring to the table that right now are just overlooked at every level of government. Yeah. 
And they they really need, like you say, a seat at the table. I mean, when I had Will Hurt on, he's he's a Republican. We don't see eye to eye on some things, but he wrote a he wrote a pretty good book on you know it, it might have been a blue sky, but you know what politics should be. It might be it might have been a little Pollyanna, but you know it, it it was a good effort. But to say, you know, his thing is everyone should have a seat at the table. Like you met women, you know. I remember years ago looking at the pictures of the Congress, and I'm like, holy crap, that's a lot of white men. <laughs> yeah that's a lot of that does not look like america if i go to my shopping store that looks nothing like my shopping store and if it was my shopping store well i'm probably be in alabama that's a joke that's a deliverance joke anyway i like to pick on alabama oh shit i just lost i don't know one of the toothless listeners anyway fun is fun anything more we want to plug out in your book or tease out on your book i would just say that uh it, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you and i I share your hope that somebody out there, whether it's in Connecticut or whether it's in Utah or whether it's in Alabama, decides to pick up this book and decide that um, they've got some ideas as to how their community could be just a little bit better. My my takeaway on legislating is that it, it's kind of hard and it takes a lot out of you, but anybody could do this. So long as you're willing to listen, you are ready to legislate. Nobody knows everything about every issue. When my colleagues speak about starting a small business or taking out a mortgage or grappling with the declining health of their parents, I've got to do more listening than I do talking. But when we talk about college affordability issues, I was on a college campus not very long ago myself, so I speak up a little bit louder. And yeah. I could use some company. We need more voices who are in those rooms fighting fighting for that that future that we're going to take part in. So thanks for having me. And, and I hope maybe some of your listeners decide to run for office. And if they do, maybe they'll find some useful tips or at least mistakes that they can avoid in this book. Definitely, man. Get off the video games, get your head out of that Instagram, you know, some of the time and, and read a book and get into politics, man. I mean, I didn't get into political science till later in my life when I got bored and had nothing else better to do, I guess. I don't know. But I've always, I've followed it roughly, but getting into it much deeper. And of course, we have a lot of journalists and and political stuff on the on the show and some politicians that have come by. Learning about it and the science of it, it's actually kind of really fun when you get into it and the and the depth of it and how it works and and the powers that be and the push and the pull and just just everything on how the wor world world re wor kind of works in that thing. And you you really get into the minutia of it. I think is the right word I'm looking for. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, yeah. And, and we all pay attention to DC, but, um, you know, if you were disappointed, like I was that senators cinema and mansion took paid family and medical leave and free community college out of president Biden's build back better plan, you should be heartened to know that a lot of States are moving forward with those policies on their oh, own. Are they really? Uh, That's here, good. That's here in good. Connecticut, I helped to write the free community college program. It's helped 7,000 students get a degree. We have 12 weeks of paid family and medical leave implemented this past January. So every new parent can take time to bond with their newborn. So while Washington is talking about problems, state, state governments are actually solving them. And that's pretty exciting. I think that's the beauty of your message because we do get turned off sometimes by the negative stuff in Washington. And it may be the message to young people that you can do so much different at a local level, get involved and, and do stuff. It's a wonderful name on the show, Will. Thanks for coming by. Thanks so much for having me, Chris, and have a great day. Thank you. Give us your plugs uh, one last time so people can find you on the interwebs, please. Absolutely. Will Haskell CT on Twitter, Will Haskell for CT on Instagram. Would love to hear from all of you on those platforms. There you go. Thanks so much for tuning in. Go to youtube.com, for chess Chris Voss. Hit the bell notification button. Go to goodreads.com, for chess Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing on my books over there. Go to all of our groups, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all those places. Those crazy kids like Will are playing on the interwebs. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other, stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.